myself. My name's Amy Noyes, and I am in my sixth and final year on the Red Clover Committee. The Red Clover Committee has three-year terms, and you're allowed to serve two of them. So this will be my last hurrah this year. So if anybody has any interest in applying for the committee, come up and talk to me afterwards, because there are two of us going off this year. So we'll be looking for applications. Um, so we have one person in the room who has never done the Red Pro Clover program with kids. Do we have anyone who's been doing it the entire time it's been around? Yeah, great. And how long is that now? Longer than I've been involved, that's for sure. 98. 98 it started? 14. 97 was the thought, wasn't it? Uh, either one. It was 97 or it's been around a while, and so is Denise, so she knows all about it. <laughs> um, great, so as, as those of, of you who have been involved in a while know, um, the, the lists evolve every year, and no one's ever happy with the complete list, and there are always some books where people don't think they deserve to be on it, and there are some books that we missed that people think should be on it, so... Um, we're always happy to hear from you folks out in the field telling us what we did wrong and what we did right. We love that feedback, so keep it coming. Uh, I'm just gonna randomly start with books. And again, stop me, slow me down if there's anything you wanna talk about with any one of these. I'm gonna start with All the Water in the World. This is an interesting book for me because it's a nonfiction book, but it's, it's a poetry book too. Um, it's the story is very lyrical, and the um, illustrations look like collage, but they're computer generated. So it's a very modern book. Who's used this book? Anyone? Ooh. So, all the water in the world is the title. And I'm not going to read all the books to you, and I'm not going to read all of this book to you, just so I know. But I love the, the very beginning. All the water in the world is all the water in the world. <laughs> so what's this book about? Water. Water cycle. Oh. Yeah. So, um, so this has a lot of great science tie-ins because it's a book about the water cycle. But it also has um, some really great it, it promotes really great art discussions. And there's lots of fun book layout elements to this book. Um, this book was a tough one for the, a lot of committee members had a hard time with it because as I said, it's very poetic and lyrical and at the end it gets a little didactic. We didn't really like that. But we decided that um, that its strengths outweighed its weaknesses. But that's something you should know. Um, and always, I know you all always pre-read the books before you read them to kids, right? Make sure you do so you know what's coming. Um, so it talks a lot about water. It has great, fun illustrations. Blue theme, as you can see. And then it gets a little greener. You see the tiger? The sweat wonder means grow, means life will flow through tigers, through trees, through you and through me. All, all, all together now, all, 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 all so precious, do not waste it, and delicious, we can taste it, keep it clear, keep it clean, keep the earth green. If it were me, I would have ended it here. That's just my take on it. Um, some great things to do with that book. Cheat sheets. Um, illustrate the water cycle using collage. Even though this book is not illustrated with collage, you can make some collage that look like the book. Um, research Native American rain dances. Make up your own rain dance. Research your school's water source. Do you have a well? Do you have a municipal water system? Where does your water come from for your kids? It doesn't come out of the water fountain. They know that, but maybe they don't know where it really does come from. Um, this book is great to introduce climate study, wet and dry climates. And um, have yourself a classroom or a library weather station. Are, is there anybody here who's a classroom teacher? 
Are you all librarians? One classroom. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> I'm usually the odd person in the room because I'm not a librarian and I'm not a teacher and I've been on the Red Clover Committee, so I'm used to being the non-librarian in the room. Any questions about all the water in the world? Why? Absolutely. It's worse than having an iPad or a... <laughs> <laughs> we are low tech. Right? We are low tech on the Red Clover Committee. So I'm going to go to Neville because somebody mentioned Neville, but first I want to show you the, um, has everyone seen Neville? No. It's uh, Norton Juster's new book. How great is that? <laughs> so one of, um, one of the suggestions we had for Neville is just to take a look at the cover, take a look at the title page, and have the kids try to predict what this book is about. What do you think this book is about? Anybody? Any ideas? Two Who doesn't friends. know? <laughs> What's that? Two friends. Two friends. Echoes? Echoes? Yodeling? Yeah, we could get some great guesses going here. This book is actually about a little boy who is moving to a new neighborhood and moving into his new house and he goes outside to check out the neighborhood and he starts calling Neville like he's missing a cat or a friend or something but he's Neville and you don't know that till the end sorry spoiler alert um, but anyway all the kids from the neighborhood start coming over and help him call for Neville <laughs> And uh, it gets to be a big party after a while. And then he goes home at the end of the day. It's dinner time. Everyone wants to know about Neville. Does he play ball? Is he smart? Does he like to read? And Neville doesn't really answer any of those questions. But he goes home, and his mother tucks him in and says, good night, Neville. And that's when you know or when you know for sure, anyway. So prediction is a, is a fun thing to do with this book. And let's see, fonts. This is a great book to experiment with fonts because of that page where everybody was yelling Neville and it, and it looked different. And one of the activities I really liked is to either use a computer or have the kids design a way to write their name that says something about them. And then you can put them all together on a big collage or a big bulletin board, and you'd have everybody's name up on the board in all sorts of ways. Yeah, let's see. Isn't that a fun one? Yeah, a good get to know you type of activity. Yeah. Sometimes sharing the Red Clover books with the upper grades at the school, that, you know, for the figures are a little bit like. Right. So, um, and, and then with a book like that, I often give the, them clipboards to record ideas, and so I would actually have them write their own question for Neville. What question would you ask yes. Neville, just to have them be interactive with it? Right. Great. Great and, suggestion. And letting kids yell in the library is always great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, the the illustrator Brian Karras. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Librarian. Okay. He has he um, uses Google SketchUp to illustrate to help illustrate this book, and he has a YouTube video about using Google SketchUp. So that's another great thing, with, especially with those older kids. If you want to go online to YouTube and check out his video on Google SketchUp, and um, can't read my own writing. Oh, just examining the book design, because this book it was designed really well. I mean, you can tell just right here from the start, but it's got some really neat elements. So if you ever do book design walkthroughs with kids, picture books are great books to do that with, obviously, but um, this one is especially good. Any more on Neville? Who's got a favorite book up here? We'll do it next. Oh, sorry, sorry. Anyone? Anyone? All right. We'll go with 
Free by the Sea. Anyone know this book? Take my little stickies off of it. This book is a mini gray book. And it's a book about friendship. Now both kind of a book about friendship. There's a little bit of a theme going here. We always find the oddest themes once we narrow the list down that we didn't notice when we were picking the list. This book is about three friends, a dog, a cat, and a mouse who live together on an otherwise deserted island. And they get a visit from a stranger um, who's actually a traveling sales fox. <laughs> and, and he um, points some things out to these three that sort of break up their harmony. Uh, but in the end, he has some kind of good suggestions. Maybe he just didn't go about giving them the right way. Um, one of my favorite elements in this book is these seed packets. One of the things um, that the fox does is the, uh, let me see if I can get this right, the dog gardens, the mouse cooks, and the cat cleans. Um, but the mouse only cooks cheese fondue, basically. And the dog only plants bones in his garden. So, so as you can see, the fox has some ideas. And, and the gift that he leaves at the end of the day are seed packets for them to plant in their garden together. So some art connections with this book, um, my favorite is design your own seed packet. What's your favorite garden food? Design a seed packet for it. And, an, and another kind of fun one is, what unusual garden would you plant? Dog's got his bone garden. What would you plant? Reminds me of bone pie. Yes. They're <laughs> odd story. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just uh, read you a bit of this one. On a pebbly stretch of shore in a beach hut by the sea, there lived a black cat, a white dog, and a little gray mouse. I love the eye patch, which you can't really see from a distance. Um, the dog tended to the garden. The cat took care of the housework, and not very well, as you might guess. The mouse looked after the cooking, and they lived happily, or so they thought. And that's where it starts to get interesting. Here, I'll pass this one around to you. See, I'm getting better. <laughs> so, um, I, here it is. So some friendship activities that could go along with this. Um, charting good friend qualities versus sort of false friendship traits. You know, Red Clover loves graphic diagrams, so you can always get into a nice T-chart there. Or um, comparing and compra contrasting um, the fox in this story versus foxes in other stories you might read. You know, why, why, does the why is the fox often the trickster? Uh, what character traits does a fox carry with him? And, and what about a dog or a cat or a mouse? There's a lot of books, like Despero, where the mouse is the cook, Ratatouille. Um, so different ways of looking at how those different characters are portrayed in this book and in other stories that the kids might know. And um, we talked about the seed packets already. So. Any questions on Three by the Sea? It's a fun book. It really is. Are they making their way back to the back? Everyone getting their eyes? Excellent. All right. I bet a lot of you have seen Grandpa Green. Have you? Yeah. What do you think of this book? Anybody? You love it? You didn't love it. The committee was really split on this book. I do. <laughs> um, this is a lovely book um, for adults, and some people thought it might not have the kid appeal of the other books. So that's that's something to think about. 
going forward with this book. It's a book about, um, it's told through the eyes of a little boy whose great grandfather is a gardener. And he has these, this topiary garden. And so the topiary tell the story of his life. Giant carrot for any of you not, not familiar with the book. Um, so he used to live on a farm. In fourth grade, he had chicken pox. Um, he had to stay home from school. This looks very Wizard of Oz-ish. He was in World War II. Uh, and so one of the fun things to make this book more appealing to kids is to take a couple book walks through it. Read it and then take a book walk and really look at the topiaries and discuss how they relate to the story. And then you could take a second book walk and look for the items grandpa has lost. On every page there's a little something, grandpa's getting a little forgetful, great grandpa. Uh, and so he keeps leaving things behind in the scenes. And as he goes, the little boy is picking up those lost objects and putting them in his wagon to bring them back home. So that's another fun way to walk through the book. Maze. Any other ideas for this book? Anybody? Yeah? I mean, I don't know if any other, depending on what group you'd be doing with, if there was a class that looked at you know, generations, if they were talking with uh, you know, their family and trying to, you know, stories and learning about family and culture. Absolutely. Um, that, that would be a great time. Yeah. Um, oral histories are, are one of the things that this book is really great to promote. So, you know, you could invite grandparents in or partner with a historical society or a senior center in your community and have the kids ahead of time brainstorm questions to ask some of their older neighbors about their life and, and then have them sit down and interview them and record an oral history. That's a great project that if you want to throw a little booth up at town meeting and show your oral history project, a lot of people would, I, I'm sure, be interested in visiting that. Um, other ideas? Yeah. I don't know how people feel about using technology with the, with the Red Clover books, but um, this we past love year it. I've started <laughs> using the document camera quite a bit more, so, um, especially when it comes to examining illustrations in a lot of detail. It's just What's the name of it again? The camera? document oh. camera, the Elmo. Oh, the it's Elmo. Show okay. the individual pages. I used it with Art and Max a lot this year. But I always made a point, like in the middle of it, when there's a double page spread, to say, okay, don't look at the screen now. You have to look at the book because you won't get the full effect unless you look at this book. Right. But I might very well use it with something like that, especially going through it two or three times. The first time I would use the book, and then I would say, now we're really going to look at the illustrations. It's a great because idea. Because it blows it up to, you know, whatever. Let them really look three at it. Three or four feet detail. by three or four feet. Nice. As a little aside, um, that's, that's one of the things that comes to the table every year when the committee's selecting books, is um, we, we walk halfway across the room from each other and say, can you see this? Because yeah. that's really important. You have to be sharing these books with the group. And, and some, are, as you know, are right at your toes, but some are back you know, quite a ways. So we try to pick books that have illustrations that can be seen by a group, but um, in, in, inevitably there's um, exceptions. Is Disney World still full of topiary? I haven't been there in a long time. I haven't either, but I'm but sure. That's my kids. <laughs> kids. I said, you, you've been to yeah. Disney, and do you remember how they carve all the bushes? Really cool. Nice. Well, I've let's got take a look at this. And a lot of kids so that, that have I seen that. I think sure. my kids connected to that really well. Nice. I read it during when we read award winners. Yep. I'll hear it again next year. <laughs> One yeah. other aside, yeah. there's yeah. A, I did a workshop did at like the, I think it was at the DCF conference last week on the book gardens that are at, um, I think it's here at Champlain. It's at really? Nice. Um, and they, Sorry. at St. Mike's, they have um, um, gardens that are based on individual books, like the Harry Potter garden where the vegetation is all based on like privets and words oh, from the book. Ooh. And then they have a stonemason who will inscribe stones with words. 
Wow. So that's just the Harry Potter garden. There's a word garden that works like those poetry walls, you know, where you can move the stones around Field and recreate different yeah. 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 poetry. Yeah. That would be a great yeah. service learning project. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah, and planning a school garden. Yeah. That's, that's another idea. Go ahead. And just give each kid a rectangle of green paper and a pair of scissors and see what the, you know, see, let them see the challenge of making a topiary. Because once you make a cut, it's made a cut. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, another bulletin board type project too, possibly. You know, make a, make a paper topiary garden. Um, yeah. So just, uh, I think it's the Smithsonian, but there's a museum that does like a digital photo archive. And if you're, you know, wanted to do, um, depending on the, the memories that he's, you know, going to, to try and pull in more um, cultural information, try and learn more about those things. Great idea. Using that. So. Or go to your nonfiction shelf, too. Yeah, pull those off. Yes? I would just say I use the document camera a lot also for presenting the Red Clover books. And I also um, sometimes put on a CD that's appropriate and have it, you know, softly in the background, still music. And it's, Sometimes the kids have actually, uh, the first few times I did it, they, it was almost like they thought it was a film or a video, you know. So oh, I actually did that for a whole school presentation, too, with, a number of years ago with the book, The Red Book, which has no words in it. Right. You know, and um, another thing I sometimes do is my assistant, and sometimes depending on the book, I know if, like there are two voices, like um, last year with, um, Let's do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I periodically pull Pam in and say, Pam, how would you feel about it? And you know, we'll do services, yeah. or sometimes I've even brought in like a mic system. Um, a couple of years ago, um, which book was it? I can't think. Um, it might have been a DCF book, I think, but it was a shorter DCF book, and I can't think of it now. But um, it was very funny, and just using the mic. I mean, even though the kids didn't, they don't need it to hear me, but it sort of like brought it alive, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So. Helps um, thing yeah, a little bit. Like yeah. um, if uh, if you, any of you have older kids um, in the middle grade range that you work with, and you're um, interested in Vermont Reads this year, Bull Run is a great book um, to break up into into parts mm -hmm. and and do as a reader's mm -hmm. theater because it's told by a gazillion <laughs> different perspectives, and each you know they rotate through the chapters. So with um, older kids. That's one of my favorite books to do that with. Any other questions on Grandpa Green? OK. We're right along. Um, since we're talking a little bit about uh, Reader's Theater, does anyone know this book, The Princess and the Pig? This is a great book to put on as a play in your classroom. Um, who's read it? All right, a lot of you haven't. Great. This is kind of a sort of a twisted fairy tale-ish book. Um, but one of the most fun things about this book is it, uh, it's a name dropper. It talks about other fairy tales. So then you can turn and go and, and look that one up and um, in sort of in a Shrek type manner. Um, this book, well, I'll just read it. I'll just read it. That's the best way to do it. Um, so the queen's holding her little baby princess. A moment later, a wet squelching noise came from the baby's diaper, closely followed by an awful smell. Yuck, shrieked the queen, dropping the baby and running off to find the royal nannies. She left so quickly she didn't notice she had dropped the baby. Over the edge of the balcony. Great perspective in the Dad, illustration. Dad. Down, down, down went the baby into the farmer's cart. Up, up, up flew the piglet into the princess's crib. And of course, the queen is not smart enough to know the difference. <laughs> and um, she thinks there. There's been a spell put on her baby to make it look like a pig. And the farmer um, just thinks he's been blessed, I, I believe. 
So anyway, they go on and they live their lives. The pig being raised as a princess and the princess being raised as a farmer's daughter. And of course they meet later. It happened in the book books. It happened in the book books. Can a pig really become a princess? So um, fun, fun book and a great one to put on um, with, with kids and pass along there. Um, so as I said before, um, read the fairy tales cited in the story and then compare and contrast. We love compare and contrast. Um, compare and contrast the lives of the princess and the life of the pig. Um, and another uh, really fun idea with this book is to put on a medieval feast. Or if you, have, if you can work with the whole school, put on a little medieval fair. Um, lots of history tie-ins, even though it's just a silly story. Any other ideas for that book? Most of you haven't read it, so no one put you too much There's, on. there's another book like it, Mrs. Potter's Pig. Oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's a lot like it. She's the baby turns into the baby. I, I don't remember. There's a swap. Yeah, there's a swap. <laughs> and she thinks her, her baby is a pig. It's, you're going to turn into a pig, and then the pig ends up in the in the uh, buggy, and she's like, you are a pig. <gasps> Horror. <laughs> Great. I'm, sh I'm sure many of you are familiar with this book. Yes? Yes. 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 Everyone? No. No? OK. This is a uh, picture book biography of Jane Goodall. And um, there are actually a couple out this year. It's a big Jane Goodall year. So, um, so they're good companion books. Jeanette Winters, I think, wrote one of them. Um, this one, that's, that's Jane when she was a little girl. And this is her, her stuffed chimpanzee that was a special toy of hers. And so they're the main characters throughout this book. Um, Jubilee is the name of the stuffed animal. And so they have some fun and crazy adventures together. Um, watching chickens lay eggs. And Climbing trees. And dreaming of life in Africa. There's sort of two kinds of illustrations. There's the general illustration, then there's these sort of rubber stamp uh, punctuations on the other page, which are interesting to go through and look at. And then at the end, she's falling asleep to wake up one day. She's older and there's no jubilee, right? To her dream come true. So that's always a nice place to start, right there at the end of the story. Why is there a photograph there instead of the illustrations we've been looking at all along? So, and, oh, before I pass it along, there's some really great back matter, of course. Um, lots about Jane, and then a message from Jane herself. How did that book, book go over with the committee as far as being able to show it and read it in a larger class? Because the pastels are opposed to the vibrant color. This, this is one of those books that was popular enough among the committee to content-wise. Yes, to sort of get over that hurdle. Most red clover books aren't this small to start out with. And then you're right, they're soft colors, there's detail in the illustration. It's a hard group read. Um, but kids love it. The kids, kids love, it. love it. The content. But the content overcame that. Yeah. Just like I can. 
the kids love it. This is so, definitely yeah. a book that you'll want to you want to read with smaller groups or you'll want to pass around um, because there is a lot of detail. Even in this very very back page, that's a sketch Jane Goodall made when she was a little girl. Or no, I'm sorry, a sketch she made when she was an adult, a cartoon sort of of her life in in Africa. My mom. Um, yes, it's very hard to do with a big group, um, but it's it's a good enough book. It made it anyway. <laughs> so, um, what have other people done with this book? Any ideas? Anybody worked with this book? No, but my thought is that I'm going to start with some biography stuff about Jane Goodall first. Yeah. And because even one of the kids when I read it as an award winner said, what's a chimpanzee? Right. So, you know, I think I, I want to do a little bit of, this is Jane Goodall and she spent her life saving with some dangerous species and before I get into how she got there. Absolutely, absolutely. Make sure the kids know who she was. Right. And, uh, and, another, and a good way to do that is to talk about her passion and talk about their passions. Maybe have them write a paragraph or tell a story about something they're really passionate about so they can make that connection. Uh, what I like about this biography is it can make connections with the youngest kids um, because of Jubilee. Uh, so what, what's your favorite toy? Can you tell us or write about an adventure you've done or real or imagined with your favorite toy? So they can they can sort of buy in on that level. Too. One thing they don't connect to is the Me Jane because none of them have seen they don't Tarzan. Know that. Right. They don't know yeah. who Tarzan is. But there is a Disney animal. Tarzan. Now. Oh, there is. Oh, so, yeah. Did you ever watch those Tarzan? I watched those Tarzan movies. I didn't do that. Right. Oh. 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 <laughs> so. Um, so another, another great idea, connection with this book, is to write a Dear Me letter to your future self. Um, you know, hopefully those kids are, can write a letter to themselves, envision themselves doing something that they're really passionate about um, and, and being an adult and, and having that be a big part of their life. Um, Uh, yeah, and, and before you even read the book, maybe just ask the kids, do you know who Jane, you know, who is Jane Goodall? What do you know about her? And have that conversation maybe before you start the read. Um, and then um, she's a scientist, so you ought to try for a science tie-in. Um, one suggestion we had was to pick if there's a classroom pet or, or a plant in the library to maybe um, start an observation journal with the class and have them observe the changes and, um, and realize how tedious that is, especially if it's a plant. Um, but it could be a good way to, to tie in with some of what Jane Goodall is really about. Any other comments on that one? Questions? We've got plenty of time. This is one of my favorite books on the list. I'm partial to nonfiction, I guess. Has anyone seen Swirl by Swirl? Yes. Yeah, this is a beautiful book. This is another book with nuance. Um, you're not going to get everything out of this book unless you can hold it on your lap. But you can get enough out of this book with a group um, and then hopefully the kids will check it out and take it home. Um, the illustrations, this is Joyce Sidman who, who wrote the text and Beth Crohn's did the illustrations and they're just gorgeous. And the book design is so cool because swirl by swirl, it's, a, it's about spirals. And you can see the text goes into a spiral. And these are spirals found in nature which is what the book's about. And then check out the copyright page. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? I love the copyright page. Um, this book can be read straight through as a story. It does, it's nonfiction, but it, it has a story. It holds up. Um, so you can read through the big print and then go back and all these swirls found in nature, those are all labeled. So there's lots of opportunity to research, um, you know, 
What is an eastern chipmunk and why is it curl up underground? Oh, there he is again. These are really fun to pick out the swirls. Um, have, has anybody worked with kids with this book? I haven't either, but I know it's going to be fun. Um, millipedes, land snails, and even the fox. I'm just going to pass this one around because you really kind of need to check it out. So um, we haven't talked about too many physical movement activities. This book is a great one. Has anybody done a human spiral where you have everyone hold hands and then you go into a spiral and spiral out and spiral out? Um, that's a really fun thing to do with a group of kids. Um, and the bigger the group, the better. Um, it's got obvious science tie-ins because it's a nature book, but it's got math tie-ins too. You can talk about the Fibonacci series and um, go outside and go on a Fibonacci hunt. Uh, if you have a school garden, that's a great, great place to go looking. Um, just in the woods, pine cones, um, there's some, there's some forget the name, but there's a good Fibonacci book out there too that'd be a great companion for this book, um, especially if you're going to go on a hunt, on a Fibonacci hunt. And, um, and one of my favorite writing activities for this book is paper plate poetry. So start out with the paper plate. Using the Fibonacci sequence, challenge the kids to write a poem. So one word, one word. Does anyone know the sequence off the top of their heads? Mm -hmm. Probably have it. Yeah, I got it here. Five, three, five, eight, oh, you're good. Yes. One, one, three, five, eight, thirteen. So it, that could be words, that could be syllables, um, you know, depending on what age groups you're working with. Um, so, and then try to write it the way they, they wrote that copyright page on a paper plate. Any other ideas? We could start a little museum if they all brought in some examples of spirals. Excellent. Like yeah. Like that. Yeah. Showcase. Go home and bring back three spirals. I'll get a thousand kids. Okay. Let's one? <laughs> bring back one spiral. <laughs> I'm from Wilkin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, there's some, some really great ideas uh, that lend themselves to a book like that. And spend some time with it, because it really is gorgeous. Questions? Is there anything I'm not hitting on that you're dying to hear? No? Anybody need to stand up and stretch? Break time? No. Okay. We'll keep plugging away then. Blackout? Yeah? People have seen this one? Yes. I think this is a fabulous addition to the list this year because it's an urban book. And a lot of our kids don't get too many urban experiences. So it's really nice to be able to introduce them to an urban experience in the library at the picture book level. And, and they can understand because a lot of them live in places with unreliable power sources <laughs> and the lights go out. Um, when my kids were growing up, it seemed like the lights went out every other day. Um, we don't live in Hyde Park anymore though. <laughs> so, <laughs> with more small water and light, it wasn't Hyde Park's problem. But. Anyway, it's about um, the lights going out in the city at night and how one family turns that into a positive. I just want to show you this page of them on the roof. What does that bring to mind? Is that familiar to anyone? Starry yeah. night. Starry night, yeah. And you know, even the kids knew it. I was surprised. Yeah. I've seen that painting enough. <laughs> that, how old? How old were the kids? Oh, I think I ran into second and third graders. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, so, you know, if you can 
pull up a copy of Van Gogh's Starry Night. That'd be a great thing to compare this to. And then have the kids try to draw a, a star scene in that style. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, when, when I read it to the kids, they liked it very much. But the concept they had the hardest time with was the big city thing. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get the idea of a building more than three stories tall. Right. And so I think when I do it as a Red Clover rather than as an award winner, I will have some photographs of skyscrapers. Great idea. Because they yeah. really had a hard time with that. Some of those kids haven't been to the city. No. And, and that's no, a haven't. really hard thing to just imagine. Um, and, and, and talking about flat take, roofs. Yeah. And partying on the what, what do you mean you can go up and party on the roof? It doesn't make any left. sense. How does the snow get off, right? So this book um, is a great study in color, um, lights on, and then it goes into blues and blacks when the lights go out. So if, if you could partner with an art teacher and maybe work on drawing yourself as a silhouette or drawing a night scene. Um, that's a fun thing to do. You can see the, the transition. And then, da, 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 the lights went out, all of them. So the storyline, a little predictable, but fun. Um, Mom! Ah, the lights are out. What are we going to do? It's OK. We have a flashlight. We can play games. We can go up to the roof. We can see the stars, which you can't do in the city when the lights are on. Um, shadow puppets, another fun thing to do with your class. Flashlight tag, shadow puppets, lights out games. Um, and then when the lights do come back on, they were having so much fun, they decided to turn them off. Turn them off and keep going with a candle. Um, let's see. I lost my cheat sheet. Okay. Has anyone else done activities with kids? Here's the page I wanted. I love the bunny. All kinds of opening up the fire hydrant because it's really hot. Oh, right. Do they even do that anymore? Yes. yes. They, they have, have to that. flush them, yes. Yeah, so they, they do do that. And they will do it when it's really hot. They will? They, they have sprinklers that they put on. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, all the water in the world, we talked about where does your water come from. This is a great book to talk about where does your electricity come from and what uses electricity. So um, maybe a hunt around the library or the classroom looking for objects that use electricity, and then a second hunt looking for things you could use instead that don't require electricity. You know, the computer doesn't come on. I need a pad of paper and a pencil, maybe. Um, I'm sure you'll get more creative than that, but there's one thought. Go ahead. Yeah, if I'm talking to no, please. One of the things I liked about it was the family dynamic, and that um, it, I'd like to discuss with the kids. What are some things that your family does together? Because you know, the book starts out, everybody's doing their own thing, right? And then because of the blackout, they come together, which is what the little boy wanted. Yes. To talk. You know, we're in a society now where it's very hard to come together as a family. I think without making an intention. Right. And how do families do that? You know, what are, what are different ways? Um, it's a great it's a great book to promote family game night or um, you know I'm gonna get the name of this wrong but no screens week is that no TV week and then they they've updated it to no screen screen free week um, so um, one idea is to host a screen free week and have uh, kids plan the events put up the posters. You know, what are they going to do? The games? Lots of, I, lots of fun things. I don't know if it, was, if it will be as big a thing next year, but I know that every time we talk about things like power outages or whatever, Irene comes up with my kids. Right. And, and I could see it popping up with that book um, immediately. Um, Where are you from? Um, Randolph. From oh, Randolph, yeah. 
Yeah, for a, for a lot of kids in our state, that's going to be the first connection they make there. And that's really important, as you know, to, to talk about that. The water will do. The water will do. Yeah. yeah, so what happens when, when it, the water cycle isn't quite working to our best benefit? Yeah, tragedy. Um, I just, the song, When the Lights Go Down in the City, I just, it's by Journey, so. It's right? Yeah. yeah. I just looked it up, so. Another, I'll have another um, couple of city books, actually, for you here. These, these books both have city tie-ins, so I guess this is the city end of our, our list. Uh, I'll start with Tia Issa Wants a Car. Has anyone read this book? Yeah, this one was, you know, every once in a while we get kind of obscure books on the list. I, I put this one in that category. But um, it's, got, it's got a lot to say. Um, and some of what it says is in Spanish. And there isn't a glossary. But the author, Meg Medina, um, does a really good job of folding those Spanish words in um, and surrounding them by English words to explain them. So one of the best things, I think, to do with this book is to have kids Make a guess at what those Spanish words mean. Can they tell by the context what, what it is? Um, and I, it's been many, many years since I took Spanish, so I don't want to offend you all by attempting to read too many of them. But uh, Tia Isa only crosses her arms. What did that bossy brother of mine say, she asked. He said, ridiculo, I repeat in Tio's hard R's like a cat purring. We'll see about that, she says. Well, that's one of the more obscure ones in there. But can your kids figure out that means ridiculous? What? Yes? In Franklin County, we have quite a few Mexican um, workers. And I, we've got a second grader and a third grader, so I just asked them how to say it. Nice. Yeah. Fabulous. Tell us what it means. Tell us what it means. If you don't have that benefit, you can you know, break out the English-Spanish dictionary, have the kids guess what they think it means, and then look it up. And then make a glossary for the book on a sheet of paper, stick it in the back. Um, totally aside, but well, helpful is Google has a translator. Yes. That um, you, could, you can type in word and actually hear them say it. Fabulous. Press the button and yep. say it and then define it. You can do that too. Look it right up there. Learn it together before you read the book. Look through, try to find them. Or maybe you want to stop along the way. Do you have an <coughs> iPad? You can do it right there with the kids. Um, this book is really about, uh, well, it's about a lot of things. But one of the big lessons in this book is about saving money and, um, and wants versus needs. Tia is Spanish for aunt. So this is Aunt Isa wants a car. It's told by a little girl who um, lives in a city, and they're from, um, they're f it doesn't say exactly where they're from, but it feels sort of like Cuba. They're from some place with a beach, and Tia Isa misses going to the beach. And she wants to save her money to buy a car so she can take herself and her little niece to the beach. Um, but she's also saving money to bring her family to this country. So there's a lot of wants versus needs going on here. And, um, and it's, a, it's a pretty complex little story. Um, so with the youngest kids, you can always do um, wants versus needs and money counting. Um, with older kids, there is the Vermont Treasurer's Investment Program, and reading is an investment. Are you familiar with that? Um, it's, I believe you can get all the, all the information online, and this would be a fabulous book to tie in with that. Can you say it again? The reading is an investment for the Vermont State Treasurer's mm -hmm. Office. They'll send they, you all the materials. Yeah, they provide three free books. I'm wondering if this is going to be one of them. Yeah. Because librarians choose them. Oh, really? Librarians yeah. are on the Vermont <laughs> Committee <laughs> to choose those books. And then um, students get a reading log, and they have to keep track of um, through a grid of how many minutes they're reading. It's 20 minutes. You can color in a square. And they send their logs to Montpelier, and they choose 10, randomly choose 10 students 
to uh, receive a $250 college scholarship through Visa. And it's very well worth it. Very, they send, they have a, they have a activities guide that they send, they send bookmarks, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Stickers, yeah. everything yeah. need. And we had a classroom teacher who actually took it upon herself to take a big pile of books from the reading, uh, from the reading list up to your classroom, and the kids did buddy reading. So that way, nice. she had three classes worth of kids who all completed the reading log. Wow, so fabulous. That was, that was exciting. Nice. We also had Bank North come and read to our kids a couple weeks ago. A lot, a lot of They're the local banks do will yeah. do that. Bank North, um, in, in my part of the state, Union Bank has an in-school banking program, and um, they're great people to invite to come talk to the kids. Um, they actually read stories and gave us the books and gave every nice. kid a piggy bank. Wow, cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> cool. And um, TD Bank, I assume they're going to do it this summer every year, does a... That's what I meant. Oh, oh okay. The, yeah, because it used to be Bank North. Right? <laughs> they, they, they do a, um, a reading program where they encourage kids, I think, to read 10 books over the summer and they'll open them up a savings account and put $10 in it if they read 10 books over the summer. And they have, I think, a bookmark where they can keep track or a bookmark in a log. Um, so call your local bank, see what they have. They, they like to get young customers. Uh, and this city is New York City. Has anyone worked with balloons over Broadway? Another one of these. So uh, this is by Melissa Sweet. It's the true story of the puppeteer of Macy's Parade, Tony Sarg. He's the guy who invented the big balloons for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And um, he, he worked for Macy's. He started out doing window decorations for them. And then they said, hey, we want to, you know, why don't you design a parade for us? We want to do a parade. Um, because they had, I guess, a lot of Im immigrant employees, and they wanted to do a parade for them, if, if memory serves me well. So Tony Sarg had done all these sort of interesting puppets and toys, and he designed the first parade, but so many people turned out that they couldn't really see the parade walking down the street because there, there were too many people in line, so he devised the idea of the balloons so everybody could see. I'll just read it to you. But now the sidewalks were so packed with people that only those in the first few rows could really see the parade. Tony realized his puppets would have to be even bigger and higher off the ground. And though the sticks helped to steer the puppets, they were stiff and heavy. Tony wanted his balloons to articulate, to move and gesture like more, more like puppets. But how? Great vocabulary in this book. With a marionette, the controls are above the, and the puppet hangs down. But what if the controls were below and the puppet could rise up? And then she goes on to tell the story of how he how he figured out how to make these giant balloons. I love this book. So again, it's another city story, um, but it's really a biography. And it's got some really fun illustrations. How do you keep the balloons from bumping into the buildings? And there's lots of problems to solve. Um, so puppet baking is an obvious jump out on this one. What would you do with this book? Take the kids to the parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or have a parade. <laughs> Field trip. Take them to a parade. You can't find a parade. Have one of your own. Um, uh, Tony Sard has an animation video on YouTube uh, about silhouette puppets. 
Uh, so that's something you could look up. And one thing I didn't mention is we're seeing more and more every year really great author websites with really great activities on them. So make sure you check those out. Typically, it's the authorsname.com in, in most cases. And um, they're usually printed right in the books, too. They have, I don't know if they, it probably is on YouTube. I don't, I'm not able to do much with YouTube. But um, more than the parade, I think, would be watching them blow up the balloons the night yeah. before. Um, oh, I'm sure that's on YouTube. Yeah, it's yeah, a great funny. idea. Yeah. Um, so Tony Sarge started out making these um, window displays that were called Wonder Town. So that's something you could do in a library or classroom too to make your own Wonder Town display. Um, you don't have to create balloon puppets. And uh, if you're looking for a good field trip, the Bread and Puppet Museum is a fun one. It's a haul for most of you, I'm sure, but it's, it's worth the trip if you can get there. Uh, I know busing's expensive these days, but that's a good one to shoot for. That is this year's Red Clover list. Um, Wilfred Gordon McDonald Partridge yes. from M. Fox. I don't know if I'm saying that title quite right. But the, the way the garden remembers everything for him. If you wanted to make a book to book connection, that would be a really nice, nice memory. I could compare it to, I didn't realize that was by Lane Smith. I mm -hmm. it around. I mean, it's so different than all of his other illustrations. Very different. I mean, that would be yeah. a neat one. That would be a neat book walk couple, through a couple of books. Um, so yeah. I'm just playing because I wanted to see where Meg Medina was from, who wrote a Spanish book, but yep. it doesn't say. But she does have a blog where she is conversing with kids about her book. So that would be nice. kind of cool for the fourth, third and fourth graders. Nice. Yeah, and a lot of authors are, are doing Skype visits. And um, I wish I had this, but I don't. Um, but I'm sure you can find it. There, there is sort of a, a loose organization of authors who will do 10 minute Skype visits for free for schools. Um, Google it, you'll find it. And uh, that's always a great way to connect. Mm -hmm. The author Kate yeah, it's Messner. Yeah. Okay. Pardon? The author Kate, Kate Messner? Yes. Has she? Kate, on katemessner.com you can find that list. Kate Messner is a, is an author who lives in the Plattsburgh area who has um, a really great website for teachers and for writers. She's, she's a former middle school teacher and I graduated college with her actually. Thank you for bringing that up. And thanks for coming. I'm happy to answer any questions or if anybody's interested in learning more about how to apply for the committee, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk with you about that too. Have a great day. Good to see you.